Dr. Nathaniel Cogley has been with us before. I believe this is his third time to visit us here. He's head of the Department of Government at Tarleton State University. Dr. Cogley, good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Pat. How you doing? Thanks Do, for having me back. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, let me ask you a question. We've had all kinds of uh, angles come in, I'm sure you have too, uh, on the recent uh, Twitter explosion that has happened between the President of the United States the squad, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats. And it's really interesting to see now from your state, Representative Al Green is kicking up the whole bid to impeach President Trump again. Now, should the president have said the tweet the way he did it? That's debatable. Should he have done it when he did it? Also open for conversation. But, Professor, is a Twitter storm like this, I read the Constitution, I don't see this as being an impeachable offense, do you? No, this wouldn't be uh, an impeachable offense. It's not a high crime or misdemeanor to um, get the biography of a few congresswomen wrong. Um, he seems to, the factually incorrect statement in his tweet was he seems to have generalized Representative Omar's biography with the whole four. Um, that wouldn't be an impeachable offense, but um, there's two ways to view impeachment. One is um, there's a genuine crime involved and two just the numbers are there Mm -hmm. so um yeah yeah so yeah and if the numbers are there then it's more politically expedient and almost doesn't matter if it's an impeachable offense or not And, and let's be honest here professor if in fact the house decided they had an impeachable cause and if they brought articles of impeachment there is no way that that a 56 57 vote Republican Senate is going to agree with them and actually remove him from office. Isn't this just an exercise in futility? Well, there's two reasons it might be an exercise in futility. Um, Usually the Speaker controls the agenda in the House. Um, The Constitution doesn't really speak on congressional rules in each chamber. It allows each chamber to develop its own rules. And so you have 200-something years of the House developing its own rules and the Senate developing its own rules. What Representative Green has done is raised the question of privilege, which is that there's an exceptional situation that's an emergency that questions the safety, dignity, and integrity of the proceedings. And he's kind of basically been able to put this impeachment charge in the House on the docket, on the to-do list. But what, what can happen here is the Speaker can preempt that by putting a table to motion or a table to send a committee so that it actually never actually comes up for a vote. She can move ahead of this and say, let's vote on sending it to committee rather than the actual articles itself. So futility, I don't think the House itself is even going to vote on this. The Speaker is going to control it and push it to committee. If anything were to get through the House, yeah, um, you know, the, the the Democrats are very far from having the two-thirds threshold in the Senate. This is a um, this is a partisan issue at this point. There would be very few Republican votes uh, based on, you know, the whole Mueller report or even the tweet, you know, back and forth. So the numbers aren't there, nor do I think President Pence is a real Democratic goal. You know, I mean, there's yeah. just so many reasons that this is not happening. Yeah. Well, and now, th- now with, with Vice President Pence being from Indiana, okay, I'm a homer, okay, so I'm, I'm going to fall into his camp. So I confess that to you right away. But I'm with you. President Pence can't be their answer, because I've got to think that Mike Pence is going to put forward a whole lot of the exact same agenda uh, that Donald Trump is, maybe without a little bit of the Circus Act, I mean, you know, which gives the Democrats reason and cause to attack the president now and then. A a President Pence would kind of take that off the table, wouldn't he? Yeah, I mean, it seems like um, Democrats, Trump has an independent streak to him, right? So he's not a, a necessarily uh, budget balancer is his priority. He's talked about a two trillion dollar infrastructure program, something Democrats should like. Uh, he did prison reform, something a majority of Democrats voted for. Um, I'm not sure uh, President Pence is better for the Democratic Party, but the main point is we're a million miles from that. I mean, mm-hmm. nothing will get through the Senate. Now, the interesting thing is because Democrats control the House and Republicans control the Senate, the Democrats could bring formal charges of impeachment and send it to the Senate, and they may want to do it for the theater of it all. But uh, Speaker Pelosi has made a calculation that that would not be good for the upcoming election cycle, that uh, just bringing formal charges for the sake of formal charges with no real chance of actually impeaching or removing the president isn't going to be good for Democratic 
reelection chances. And so it's interesting that even though Democrats control the House and many Democrats from solidly Democratic districts like to use aggressive language that the president should be impeached, and the speaker is from San Francisco. She's from one of these Democratic districts. Mm-hmm. She's made the call that this is not good for the party because there's the, the, the Democrats have, I think, 235 seats right now. You need 218 for a majority. But 31 of these Democratic seats are from districts Trump won. So she has to not just do what's good for her district and other very urban districts, but to be good for these 31 districts where the the representative that was elected bringing charges of impeachment against the president, the president that they selected is not good politics in those 31 districts. So she's being more cautious trying to keep a majority control. Well, and I think, too, um, and, and, and I want to go to one other subject after this, but to close this portion of it, uh, Doctor, I think that when um, Al Green said, I'm concerned that if we don't impeach the president, he will get reelected. I think people will look at a comment like that and realize that at least some of the Democrats are moving by purely political motives, that it's not about country and right and justice and all that. This is somebody that's trying to control the 2020 election. Um, let me ask you, and, and I, we did not have the chance to tell you I would ask you about this, but in all the goings on with everything that's happened in what, what I'm calling the Twitterverse here, of everything that's happened between the president and the squad and everybody else in both parties, how large was it that you had Nancy Pelosi kind of shut down yesterday on the House floor because comments that she made were viewed as being personally directed toward an individual who happens to be president of the United States. She was called out for that, and she basically was not able to speak for the balance of the day. Very early in Tip O'Neill's time as Speaker, that happened. So it's been a long time since that's happened. That's, that's quite an event, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a more of a symbolic event, but it's quite interesting. That's certainly not the optics she wanted. Um, she wanted this to be a very uh, aggressive charge against the president, that the president's comments were unacceptable and, you know, the R word racist. And it, it kind of blew up in a big mess in her face. And that's certainly not what she wanted. Um, she does want to control the chamber, set the agenda in the chamber. chamber, And um, she's going to look to reassert herself today and try to avoid uh, what would be a, a vote on an impeachment resolution that she doesn't want. Um, yeah, that was exceptional. Um, but, you know, a lot of this was reactionary. This was thrown together in a couple days, you know, based on a certain interpretation of a, of a tweet. Um, so, yeah, it, it wasn't good optics for her, and she's going to try to have better optics going forward, I think. Do you think some people, including some Republicans, are rushing in to try to give ancillary defense of the president and what he did? That almost if other people say, well, I get the president's motive for why he tweeted what he did. I, I don't think this was good optics. I don't think this was the right thing to say at the right time. He made he almost made it sound like all four of the minority women, these freshman Democrats, were all from outside the country, and they're not. Uh, and it made him look a little silly and a little overreactive. And some people in the party are just going crazy. We just don't understand the president and his motives. This is awesome. He's going to bring him to their knees, blah, blah, blah. Do, do you feel that sometimes, and, and I know this is a stretch, but do you feel that some Republicans and some conservative Republicans are having to try to endorse and support actions that they normally wouldn't support just because they feel the need to keep waving the Trump banner? <laughs> Uh, President Trump's amazing. I mean, there's two interpretations of him. One is that he's like an expert in game theory and all these kind of feuds with uh, Megyn Kelly yeah. or, you know, Rosie O'Donnell, that they're all like really calculated, you know, because he'll say something that's not politically correct that a standard politician wouldn't say. And then there's a, a certain interpretation of it. Um, presented as the only vi- only valid interpretation, and then Trump keeps hitting on the the nuances of what he said. Um, so yeah, I think there's um, and there's some people who just feel he stumbles into it. You know, he's going on instinct and he stumbles into these things. Um, Maybe he lucks so, out uh, a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, you know, there's a factually incorrect statement. I don't think that is a major policy issue that the voters are going to care too much about, whether the president was factually correct about someone's bio or not. But uh, Trump relishes this battle over policy, over border security, over foreign support for Israel, over, uh, you know, not just letting uh, people enter illegally into the country, but to detain and process. 
um, Trump relishes these uh, policy debates. And if you read through the Twitter feed, I mean, that's what 99% of it is. And then there's this one tweet where he gets the bio wrong. Um, so, yeah, I do think that um, maybe some people have learned their lessons. You know, there's been a, a bunch of moments in the Trump campaign and presidency where the mainstream media says, oh, this is it. This is different. This is the final nail. And it's, it turns out not to be. And it turns out that uh, President Trump is relatively popular in the Republican Party and Republican voters would like to see, uh, you know, the, the Republicans support the president, especially when something's open for interpretation. Yeah. And, and I think a year from November, nobody's going to remember this week as they're going into the ballot booth. I, I just don't think it's going to be that large on the landscape. Hey, Dr. Nathaniel Cogley, always appreciate your insights there, sir, from Tarleton State. I hope things are good for you down there in Texas. In the next couple of days, we're going to have enough heat up here that I'm just going to can it and send it back down there because you guys are much better handling it than we are. But listen, for today, I appreciate you very much you being on. I look forward to talking again. Thanks. Thanks so much, Pat. Yep. Talk to you soon. Dr. Nathaniel Cogley from Tarleton State University. Podcasts by Federated Media. 